You were saying about privacy is power, and I read it, and I was saying that many people tend to say that this is pessimistic or all the things that happen, but um, you are pretty optimistic. I mean, you, you just say, come on, guys, this is terrible what we did, but we can just uh, twist it and we can, we can make things. And um, my first concern is, where is the power? I mean, you say privacy is power. Is it the power in, in protecting our life, ourselves, or on them? trying to breaking it, to, to kind of selling it? It's both. Power is a game. And the more they know about us, the more tech companies know about us, the more they can influence our decisions, they can interfere in our lives. And the more we know about them, the more we have a chance at regulating them appropriately and protecting ourselves from them. So data really is what carries the power and therefore Privacy is power because if we protect our data, that gives us more, more power, especially as a citizen, we, as, as, a, as a group of people. And, you know, this today is, is, is all about rights. And we talk about the right to privacy. It's part of the human, the declaration of human rights. And there's a reason for why it's there. And it's just incredible that most of the Internet is funded through surveillance. Most of the Internet is, is funded through a system that um, massively violates the right to privacy of all citizens and we shouldn't accept that we shouldn't get used to it and we can turn it around so yes on the one hand i'm very pessimistic in that the the scenery is a really grim one at the moment we are violating rights uh, all the time and it can have serious consequences but at the same time i'm optimistic in the long run because i think the situation is so bad at the moment that it's unsustainable something has to change Absolutely. And um, uh, we'll try to elaborate on, on all this, but um, I was listening right now, I don't know if you were able to, uh, not to talk, but to listen, maybe you were, um, uh, listening to, um, to Laia Bonet, listening to Carmen Artigas, to Cristina, and um, Carmen Artigas, Secretary of State, was pointing out these, well, they were well, uh, they, they all were uh, pointing out this um, future, fair, inclusive, equitative, um, that I mean, we need to, to create a new future for this. But uh, uh, you tend to say that privacy protects us against unfair discrimination. Many people maybe say, why? I mean, why is that? Can you elaborate a bit on that, just in case someone from home is just saying, why is this uh, lady saying that? I mean, why is it? Of course. In general, it's interesting because in the public debate, many times privacy is viewed as something that protects wrongdoers. But in fact, most of the time, privacy protects innocent citizens from all kinds of wrongdoing by others. And one kind of wrongdoing, one kind of abuse of power is discrimination. And it's very common and it's very hard to fight against unless we protect privacy. So here's an example. Um, so you go on Facebook and you say everything you like. You say you like this music. You say you like um, this band and going these places and so on. And you think that you're not sharing very sensitive information. But actually, companies might use that information to infer very sensitive things. For instance, your sexual orientation or your political tendencies. And let's say you apply for a job. Let's say you apply for a job at a tech company or a big company or a bank. And those big companies buy your file from data brokers. Data brokers are companies that want to have a file on every internet user. And that file can contain anything from your social media activity, your browsing history, your purchasing power, and your purchasing history. Um, medical records, educational records, all kinds of things. And let's say that an employer um, is faced with two candidates. They're both really well suited for the job, uh, but one of them, it turns out, that has a, a religion that the employer doesn't like or has a sexual orientation that the employer disapproves of or has a political opinion that the employer doesn't like. So, There's nothing to guarantee us that they won't use that information against you because it's very hard to police. If you, if you were to complain and say, why didn't I get the job? They can always say, well, there was somebody else better suited, or we thought that they would be uh, better for the culture in the company. So as long as they have access to that data, they can discriminate against you and you will never know about it. And if you suspect it, you will never be able to prove it. So the only way to protect ourselves against discrimination is for employers, prospective employers and governments and other institutions not to know certain things about you that they don't have a claim to know. Your sexual orientation is your own matter. Why would they? Why would they need to know that? So, so let's say I, I want to get back into that data brokers um, right now. But um, just before I jump into another thing, that means that our data is so like easy and cheap. 
to anyone. I mean, I can apply for a job position or I can go to the bank because I need some money to have uh, my next adventure with uh, my family, my wife and my baby. And maybe they deny it because they, they, they learned something from me? Yeah, it could happen. And there, were, there would be no, no way for us to check on that. That's one of the dangers of data. It's so invisible. It's so underground. And data also has a very, very explosive combination. On the one hand, it's very cheap. So you can buy somebody's credit card number for just a few euros. On the other hand, it's very valuable. If, if you have enough of it, you can become a billionaire. So it's cheap and valuable and it's incredibly sensitive. It's incredibly, incredibly dangerous because knowing certain things about someone can make you access their lives in ways that uh, you shouldn't. Like, for example, committing identity theft and pretending to be someone else because you know their, their, their data. So th this combination of data being cheap, valuable and sensitive is really, really very dangerous. OK, but then let, let me just um, twist a bit what you were saying. You, you talked about uh, millionaires. You talk about data. We talk about controlling our data. And I just remember a couple of years ago, I think it was a uh, just before the pandemic, the, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, he was just saying that we should, or he was asking to the big tech companies uh, about the data dividend, so that they would pay us in exchange of our data. What do we do then? Yes, this is an, an attractive position for many people, the idea that we should be our own data brokers. Instead of having middlemen, we can sell our own data directly or, or have a dividend. And I think this is very misguided. Um, for one reason, you will get cents. You will get very, very little because, as I said, like data is cheap. It's valuable, but it's only valuable if you have a lot of it. And individuals will never have a lot of it. So that's one way in which the asymmetry between tech companies and citizens is dangerous. So you will earn very little, so little that it's not worth it, but you will make them billionaires. And, that, and that's a problem. But secondly, there are all kinds of reasons for why we shouldn't think about personal data as private property. Um, if I, if I sell my personal data, say I sell my genetic data, I'm selling the data of not only my parents and siblings and children, but also very distant kin whom I've never met, but could, who could get denied life insurance or who could get deported. This has already happened. It's not even hypothetical. So what moral authority do I have to sell my data when that data contains data about other people and has consequences for other people? So in the Cambridge Analytica example, only 270,000 people sold the, their data for about a dollar. Uh, but why do they have the moral authority to do that when that data gave the firm access to 87 million people's data? And with that data, they created a, a, a tool to profile voters around the world and try to interfere with elections. So we shouldn't think about data as property. Well, actually, there is uh, many, uh, let's say, um, uh, in, uh, health insurances that just uh, make you a discount, let's say, in case you wear one of these watches and they can just listen if you're active or not. So, uh, in a way, we are, um, let's say, we're exposing the most vulnerable. So, the ones who can pay it say, no, you don't access to my watch. And the ones who can't, or say maybe five or ten euro can be a good deal, uh, they sell it. So, uh, again, we are uh, towards the, the, the most vulnerable ones. That's true. And there's always been a history of, of privacy in which the rich can buy privacy and the poor can't. But to warn the rich, privacy has become so important because we, we have never had the ability to have so much data and we have never had the ability to analyze that, so, that, that amount of data. So it's going to come back and bite them, bite the rich and bite society because the data from poor people who cannot afford to buy privacy is going to be used to infer things about everyone else. So say somebody who's very similar to me, but whom I've never met, um, sells her data. But let's say that we share psychological traits. Um, companies can infer very sensitive things about me without ever having even been close to my data. So one of the things I argue in the book is that we should think about privacy as a collective endeavor. Privacy is as much collective as it is personal. And if we don't act together, we won't be able to protect ourselves. I, I wonder if, um, I remember uh, Lyle and Ed was talking uh, some years ago about the metaverse. Um, well, this is not life, we are live. I mean, old people, normal people, uh, Carissa is also live. Everyone is live, but um, we're a bit worried about what's gonna happen there. Um, Zuckerberg, um, this, um, I was going to say curious man, um, said some years ago that privacy was dead. 
And then, after some years, he said that the future is private. So it, it's kind of a blowing mind. But um, if we think on that, um, and also connecting it to a thing what Karma was saying, um, I don't know if after the pandemic the surveillance capitalism is worse or not. I mean, we are all addressing or trying to address this, but did the pandemic didn't play like a, it was not a good thing for us? No, it wasn't. It really wasn't. Uh, it pushed us towards having to use tech much more than we used to. And that means that uh, tech companies got to collect much more data. It again used an argument that is very old and, and has been used many times and will be used in the future. That in times of crisis, we just need people to give up their civil liberties uh, without questioning and, and without asking whether it's actually necessary. Um, but at the same time, a, a little like sliver of hope is that people are more and more aware of how we are being coerced into giving up our data. So I think maybe five years ago, many people would have said, well, you, you're choosing this. If you don't want to use Facebook, then don't use it. But today it's crystal clear that we're not choosing this. That in order to be full participants in our society, in order for our kids to get education, in order for us to have a job, we need to interact with these platforms. We don't have a choice and the terms and conditions are not negotiable. So I think that awareness makes people a little bit more likely to resist abuses and to be a bit skeptical of big tech, which, which we weren't a few years ago. And I'm also very worried about the metaverse. I mean, you, know, you, you mentioned how Zuckerberg had said that, that privacy was dead in 2010. Uh, meanwhile, he was buying the four houses around his own house so that he could have privacy. So yeah, he wanted privacy to be dead for his users, but not for himself. Mm -hmm. And that, that we can even think about trusting a company like Facebook that has betrayed users time and time again to develop something like virtual uh, reality is really scary. If you think about the data that is, that is collected today, which is reams and reams of data, just imagine what they can collect if they have sensors all over the place. Just to give an example, if they track your eyesight all the time, they can infer things about your psychology, your cognitive abilities, whether you might be getting uh, Alzheimer's, and they can infer your emotions, they can infer your identity. It's so sensitive, and we have to make sure that we have the rules in place so that when that technology gets developed, we're safe. And at the moment, we are not safe. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, Carissa, if I read it in the book, 5%, um, um, or um, if um, it was uh, reading some interview from you or whatever, but um, I remember you explained that you started um, looking at the privacy thing um, when investigating a family matter and listening to Edward Snowden. Um, when, when everything happened with Snowden, uh, you realized that there was a big thing here. I wonder if with uh, Franz Haugen right now in Europe and in, in, in America, the whistleblowers, they say that this, um, this person who was working on Facebook and now is uh, just clarifying what I, we could say we already knew. Um, how do you feel in front of that? And, and I don't want to sound pessimistic here because we were saying Europe is doing a great job uh, in terms of regulation. But according to corporate Europe uh, observatory, the lobby, the, the tech lobby, let's say, is the most powerful in Brussels, investing, investing hundred million um, dollars or euros, I don't remember, right now in, in uh, the lobby. And one of the most uh, relevant ones, one of the, the ones who invest more is Facebook with 5.5 uh, million dollars, uh, Google, I think it was 5.8, and Microsoft 5.3. Um, is there anything we can do or? Um... We have to, there's so much at stake. Our democracy is at stake. So one thing to say is the importance of whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are really, have a fantastic and a very important role in society and we have to treasure them and protect them. Because without them, we wouldn't know half of what we know about what's going on in the world from government to powerful institutions. And one of the uh, advantages of having somebody like, like Frances Haugen is that she has so much documentation and it's so damning. It shows perfectly well how Facebook knew it was harming teenagers and it didn't do anything to stop it. And in, in terms of, of Brussels and lobbying, this is a huge concern. It's partly a result of the power that tech companies have been able to amass thanks to our data. So if we didn't give them our data, they would have a lot less power, a lot less money uh, with which to buy political clout. And 
it frustrates me that we tend to think about innovation and technology as something that has to be physical or, or software, it has to be digital, but actually the most important technologies in our history have been political technologies. Democracy is the most important technology we have come, out, come up with. Yeah. So when Europe thinks about itself, I would like it to think about itself as a region that is really at the cutting edge of technological development in terms of regulation. Regulation is a kind of power itself. Not only tech has power, we have power partly through regulation. And I think that Europe is very uh, wise in, in being at the cutting edge of that and that we have to push forward because clearly something like the GDPR was a historical achievement. It was uh, fantastic and super important, but clearly it's not enough. Okay, but you said Europe is wise. Uh, we all agree, but what about the, the um, let's say the the role of the di diplomacy uh, in this type of issues, important issues for the society? I mean, how does Europe manage these rights, but at the same time treats with different perspectives, like the one set by the U.S. or um, like the one in China, which is getting every time closer and closer with more of our society using Chinese products with kind of other rules? Um, I don't know. How can we manage all that? It's going to be a challenge and diplomacy has never been more important. Maybe the, the, the last time that it was so, so important was during the Second World War or after the Second World War. And we need that kind of alliance again. We need to rekindle our democratic alliances, in particular to the United States. The United States is very important for them to pass a federal privacy law. It's, um, it's just incredible that it's, it's, it's one of the, the last uh, developed countries that doesn't have one. And it's going to be very important for us to agree on three things. How do we regulate data? How do we regulate AI? And how do we establish minimum cybersecurity standards? Those three things are so urgent. And I'm happy to see that um, Biden, in contrast to his predecessor, is trying to rekindle those alliances. We should uh, take it seriously. And it's going to be very important for, for democracies to join forces against this view of uh, Te technology as an authoritarian tool like China is using it. And in particular, we should be very careful in trying not to beat China at its own game because it wouldn't be a victory for the West. Instead of trying to do technology exactly like the Chinese are and, and kind of enhancing surveillance, we should be walking away from that model. We should be walking towards our democratic and liberal values. And that means protecting privacy. So if China is exporting surveillance, which it is, it's exporting cameras to around 150 countries, which is incredibly dangerous because it gives China access to a lot of data and it gives China the possibility of turning off a city if it owns the smart sensors and the smart city itself. So if China is exporting surveillance, it's our job to export privacy. It's our job to develop technology that protects people uh, from the surveillance that China is exporting. And for that, we need an alliance with the United States and, and other democratic countries. I'm, I'm, I'm... I'm happy you said that, and, and the whole audience is, is happy with it also. And uh, just in case you were, well, if you, you can do it also, Carissa, but any of you who's looking from home, the next session in, in five minutes is going to be the role of cities in building an inclusive, safe, and responsible digital transformation. So I think it's just key to um, key on that on that uh, sense, Carissa. Um, um, you, you said in a recent interview that we need to have to, or we need to send a clear message to our governments uh, and ask them to protect our privacy. Um, many people, probably uh, many people who's not, um, I would say so informed, so connected to these issues, tend to think that this only happens in dictatorships, the, the, the fact that they spy you or all these uh, issues with privacy. But what I wonder is more, um, let's say, anthropological thing or sociological thing. If privacy is clearly in our offline lives a human right, if we, if we don't give certain information to certain people, if we preserve it, if we protect it so much, why is it so hard to understand that no one can un uh, uh, undermine it uh, in digital? It's been a combination of things, but one, one reason is that tech companies have been better at creating narratives than they are at creating tech. They're geniuses at creating narratives, and they sold us the narrative 
that privacy was something that we didn't need anymore. That like it was something um, appropriate for the past, but that we didn't need it anymore. Clearly, that is very, very wrong. But from the time they sold us that narrative to the time we realized it wasn't true, decades went by and the system is very entrenched. But that doesn't mean we can't change it. Just think about the history. Think how we've changed things from uh, banning child labor to introducing eight hour um, work days and weekends and voting for women. And there are all kinds of things that we've done that didn't seem remotely possible at some point. So we can do this and we should do this. The, the, the stakes cannot be higher. And if we want to enjoy a liberal democracy in the following decades, if we want to leave a democracy for our children, we better protect privacy fast. Uh, I remember when you were saying that the social networks did very well. Um, this is a really personal um, story, but I teach uh, to uh, American students in, in uh, as, as an associate professor for New Haven. And three, four years ago, I asked them, how many friends do you have in Facebook? I, I always make that question. Well, not in Facebook now, but three, four years ago, I was in Facebook. And um, they were insisting they had more than 1,000 and 2,000. And I, I had to clarify, okay, guys, I mean friends, real friends. How many friends do you have? 1,000, 2,000, no, 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 real. Of those 1,000, how many are real? I mean, how many would you give them money? How many would you go with them anytime when they call you and they, they have a problem? 1,000. So they probably did a good job because in a sociological way, they even twisted that, which is terrible. Um, I actually have to say that they, they don't think that way uh, nowadays, but um, it was it was um, worrying. Um, another important thing, and, and I want to, well, I have so many things I wanted to, to ask you, but, um, I would like to, to um, really, maybe it's an easy, stupid thing, but many people tend to say, um, I don't care. I was thinking of my students when you were saying that. I don't care. I mean, what do they want to spy on me? I mean, I'm, I'm nobody. I, nobody knows me. I'm, I'm not famous. I'm not popular. So I don't care. What are, what are they going to do with that? Can you just, and probably going back to what uh, we, we did at the beginning, talking about those data brokers and all that, why is it so important to protect our privacy, our uh, life connected to human rights? So what, one easy way to do it is, is tell them, okay, if you don't mind, then give me your, your, your password to your, to your email and your accounts. And most people will say, no, thank you. And then you can ask them, okay, why, why not? If you, don't, if you really don't care about privacy, right? And the reason is you, you can only sincerely say that you don't care about privacy if you don't care about being humiliated, extorted, having your identity stolen. Um, and losing your democracy. If you care about any of those things, then you care about privacy, whether you, you know it or not. So one reason is, even if you don't care about yourself, presumably you care about your children, your partner, your community. And that's enough reason to protect your privacy. But if you care about yourself, which most people do, um, nobody wants to have their identity stolen. That's a nightmare. It can, it can take you months and thousands of euros to defend yourself in courts. Nobody wants to have their money stolen. Nobody wants to, to be publicly humiliated. Nobody wants to be extorted and nobody wants to be discriminated against. So those are just like easy ways. But more generally, I think we have to be very mindful of how technology is not neutral. It just isn't. A gun is made for something in particular. It's not made to cook, right? Technology has certain assumptions and certain objectives in place. And surveillance technology is always tied to control. Surveillance leads to control. So even if you think that, oh, you know, this is just important in authoritarian countries. No, it's not. First of all, we are risking sliding into authoritarian tendencies. But secondly, you can see how, for, for instance, work relationships are changing. Before we had email and before we had smartphones, your work ended at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. and you didn't hear about your boss until the next morning. Not right now, we are more and more being controlled outside of, of work. There's, there's this kind of work encroachment tendency that is shrinking the private sphere. So many things are, are shrinking the private sphere and that's bad news um, for democracy. So one of, the, one of our goals, one of our objectives, one of our, our missions is to protect the physical tangible world. Again, talking about virtual reality and this push that Zuckerberg is trying to do. I don't even want to mention the word. <laughs> I, just, I just get choked on the word that he uses. Um, we have to protect the tangible world, our, 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 our physical relationships. Being able to go into the woods for a walk with a friend and have nobody listen to that conversation and have nobody know where you are. Okay, Carrie, so let me ask you. Uh, I'm going to ask you an effort because um, we, we only have one minute and I would love to be uh, 30 more minutes talking about lots of things. But um, 
you were saying about these goals, and the problem I, I realize it's that there is this little, let's say, thin line. We're in, in uh, it has both sides. Even in the cities, even as we were saying before, there is a very positive thing of technology that can help a lot, can prevent security. There are lots of things. That's probably why it's so difficult to address certain things because the line is so thin. So. Um, for example, let's say the ADMS, uh, Automated Decision Making Systems, they are great for certain things, but be careful because you can maybe take some decisions, a machine can take some decisions which are not uh, correct. But the last question, it's an easy one for a minute. Um, how can we mm, kind of bring moral or ethics to an algorithm? I mean, how can a human code that? Because that depends a lot on the human who codes it or on the amount of humans who codes it. So which is the good one? How can we make a universal good one? We can't. Ethics is about human beings and it's not codable. It's not, you cannot tra transform it into simple rules. So that's why we have to remain in control and make sure that the algorithms are nothing but a tool because that's what they are. They're a sophisticated tool, but we are the moral agents and we are responsible for the tools that we create and that we use. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Carissa. It was so, so great to have you. Uh, Carissa Bellet, in case you didn't know about her, she's a researcher, philosopher and writer uh, for the Institute for Ethics in AI uh, at the University of Oxford. It was uh, really interesting to listen to you, buy this book, read it, but especially apart from read it, I mean, it's great to have these books in, in the shelf, but read it. And apart from read it, um, practice what it says at the end. There are some great recommendations uh, on how you can turn your life a bit safer, how can you protect your life and, uh, and get back your privacy to yourself. Um, the good thing is that uh, all this data tends to be very valuable when it's recent. So if you change it, you'll be safe very soon. Thank you, Carissa. It was great having you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you.